Well, let's just look at the facts. Um, in the United States today, uh, on any given day, there's a hundred million people, nearly a third of the population, who are suffering from some digestive distress. A quarter of the population is actually using uh, over-the-counter or prescription medication for digestive issues uh, on any given day. In our emergency hospital visits, 12% of those cases are gastrointestinal related. So that means you're going to a hospital in an ambulance because of some serious medical condition, most of which can be prevented by these methodologies. And so we have to understand digestion. Listening to the Foundation of Wellness, a refreshing take on diet and lifestyle. Join me, Marisa Moon, as we tackle modern health with innovative and ancient principles. I'm a certified primal health coach and intermittent fasting instructor at MarisaMoon.com. Hey out there, it's me, Marisa Moon. Thank you for joining me on the show. I'm really excited about this interview because I brought a digestive health expert on finally to help us understand what he explains as the five stages of digestion and why digestive enzymes are so important and how to know if you need to supplement with HCL, hydrochloric acid, like I do, because it's actually quite common to be low in stomach acid. I even carry them around with me at all times. And uh, I also carry my H2 molecular hydrogen. If you want to know more about that, we did one way back, but I actually use this brand now. It's called Drink HRW. So you can check that out some other time. But our guest today is not only an expert on fixing digestion, he's like a living Superman. Check this out. Wade Lightheart is a three-time Canadian national all-natural bodybuilding champion who also competed as a vegetarian, which had never been done before, and he tried it as sort of a self-experiment and totally succeeded. He's also a former Mr. Universe competitor and host of the Awesome Health podcast. Having majored in sports science at the University of New Brunswick, Wade has authored numerous books on health, nutrition, and exercise, which he's sold in over 80 countries. Now, after competing in Mr. Universe and his health failing him following a competition victory, which he explains in the interview, Wade began to search for answers. In the process, he learned so much about what makes digestion work, and he became really passionate about it, along with other principles that form what he calls the awesome health system. So Wade's the co-founder and the president at BioOptimizers, a digestive and health optimization company. He's been in the health industry for over 25 years, coached thousands of clients, and is sought out by athletes and high-performance oriented individuals. People worldwide are coming to him for his advice on how to optimize their health and fitness levels. BioOptimizers has been featured on so many of the biggest podcasts, including, including Bulletproof by Dave Asprey and Ben Greenfield's podcast. I listened to his interviews. They're pretty amazing. So I decided I want to do a Bio Optimizers giveaway. I'll probably do two or more giveaways depending. I don't know. I got to see how it's going to all work out. But if you want to get in on this, I want to share all these goodies with you because they shared so many with me. And uh you got to follow me on Instagram at Marisa underscore moon underscore and our podcast page at foundation of wellness underscore podcast on Instagram. Now, if you're not on Instagram, just head over to my Facebook group because I might make an exception and include the people in my Facebook group for this giveaway. I haven't decided yet. It's not that easy to do when you want to do a random winner, but that Facebook group is called the foundation of wellness and you can find it at facebook.com slash groups slash fow podcast here we go you guys hey wade i'm so excited to have you here you're pretty big time i gotta say (laughs) Uh, i don't know about that but i'm certainly grateful to be here well i don't think it's a matter of an opinion when you've won three national all-natural bodybuilding champions in canada what is all-natural bodybuilding So basically, these are uh, competitions that uh, require you to 
be under IOC WADA type testing for drugs and chemicals is and sort of that you comply with all those standards in order to compete uh, nationally and then internationally. And so I went down that route uh, as a testament that I wasn't augmented by, uh, you know, ex exogenous drugs, mm -hmm. um, which is quite common in all levels of amateur and professional sport, unbeknownst to a lot of people in the public. Yeah, I believe it. Well, that's a huge feat that you did three times, and I know your health journey didn't stop there. Why don't you kind of take us through the things that got you so passionate about health in the first place? Sure. Uh, well, th you know, you always have to look at what's the backstory, and I think there are components in everybody's life that are turning points or positions that kind of you know, you're kind of at a decision making tree and they, they make or shape your destiny. And for me, that happened when I was 15 years old. My I lived in a small community in Canada. And what happened is my, in, in, in a very short period of time, three life changing events happened to me. Number one, we moved to a, an area that was five miles to my closest neighbor, 35 miles from the community I was, 55 miles from a town. And so I had a lot of time to be by myself and to contemplate and to read and do things that kids maybe my age weren't necessarily doing. Second thing that happened was my sister, who was four years my senior, got diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease, which is a form of cancer of the lymph nodes. And I watched her over the next four years go through the medical model, conventional medicine, where the treatments were what in my opinion making her sicker than what the disease was and she died at 22 years old I'm sorry yeah and the so what i realized at a very early age is number one your life wasn't a guarantee and your health wasn't a guarantee so those had a big impact on me especially in that environment there was not real lot of distractions and all the horrors of going through anybody that's been touched by those type of diseases the third thing that happened was my sister had given me a bodybuilding magazine at that time, which mm -hmm. had a picture of uh, Troy Zuclaud, who had Mr. California at that time, two pretty girls, and being 15 years old and going out of my mind with testosterone, as all young boys are, <laughs> and uh, nothing else better to do, I decided that I would take up weight training and built a gym in my barn and started working out and building, you know, sawhorses and two-wheelers and tractor tires and uh, makeshift pulleys and all this sort of thing, kind of almost like Rocky. I think it was four when he fought uh, Yvonne Drago in that movie, kind of that style. <laughs> yeah. And um, got a mentor in the name of a guy by the name of Arnold Schwarzenegger who said that with hard work, self-discipline, and a positive attitude, you could achieve anything you wanted in life. And I was not in a community that had any type of the messaging. It was hard work, mm -hmm. but not positive attitude and self-discipline. And so I took him on as my mentor and his ideologies and practice it and ultimately led to going to university, studying exercise physiology. And then when I got out of university, which I was very disappointed with my education there, that was a background of a lot of different components, but there was like no unified, like, how do I actually produce a result? It was information, but not application. And so uh, after that, I went off and started seeking out various mentors and working my career in the health and fitness industry, working on every single level from, you know, retail and warehouses and forms and books and sponsored athletes and being sponsored, owning a store and eventually consulting with development, product development and so forth. That in, after 16 years, I ended in Concordant, I was kept on with my bodybuilding career and and at 2003, I got to represent my country at the Mr. Universe contest, which was awesome. However, I was doing it on a plant-based diet and I was applying what I would call um, ineffective processes to that. There was nobody doing that, what I was doing That's at the I time. And everybody said it wasn't possible. Yeah, so I had some flaws in that. But at the end of it, I gained 42 pounds of fat and water after the contest. So I went from Mr. Universe to Mr. Marshmallow, where I met a uh, medical doctor by the name of Dr. O'Brien. And he... He was taking very advanced cases of illness and reversing it through using dietary aids like enzymes and probiotics and minerals and specialized diets. And I thought, wow, this is really amazing. He was super vibrant, senior citizen, had overcome some serious conditions on himself. And I was like, I went to him and he said something to me that changed my life. And that was, 
I said, you know, Dr. O'Brien, I've got the best coaching in the world. I've got a background and all this sort of stuff. I'm, I've got total discipline. I've got all the things, you know, positive attitude, self-discipline, you know, I put in all the work and I've got to this physical crisis. And he says, well, Wade, you've learned how to build the body from the outside in, not the inside out. And from that, I engaged in his program using digestive aids, enzymes, probiotics, mineralization, hydrochloric acid, all these different things that he said was essential to bringing the food that I was consuming and converting it into the energy units and building blocks that are required. And, and he said, largely in part, this is compromised, not just in you, but in all the population. I just got there faster because of my restrictive dietary plan that was very counterproductive, was great for performance and counterproductive to health. And so long story short, within six months, I made a complete recovery. And now that felt better than I ever had before. I tested that with over 15,000 clients that we had, my business partner, I Matt and I around the world and gathering a bunch of data with wow. all different sets and backgrounds and age groups and dietary practices and stuff. And then from there, four years later, I actually made a comeback, uh, went to the, you know, won all my national championships again, captured two more national titles, went to the world championships again, placed better, did better. And had no side effects, no compromisation. My body felt great the whole time. I didn't have a rebound, any of that stuff. And at that Whoa. point, we started sharing this en masse around the world. And uh, today that mission is is through my company, Bioptimizers. Unreal. That really is tremendous. I just thought it was a given that everyone who competes in a physique, like bodybuilding type contest rebounds, like they're going to gain the weight. It's just like an accepted thing. And uh, you're saying that doing it a certain way from the inside out, along with all your training, made it so that you could sustain something that seemed comp comparable to your fitness state of the competition. One of the, yeah, you, you're right. And one of the things that we've identified by optimizers is that there's three sides to kind of the the, the triangle, if you will, that people didn't generally go for. There's aesthetics, which is what attracts most people into whether it's dietary, fitness, or that sort of stuff. And that was the case in my own self. I wanted to look a certain way. And then you kind of switch over to performance. So you, as you get older, you're less concerned about maybe what you look, but maybe you really want to have a lot of energy to deal with all the kids and your work, or you have a higher travel schedule and you're really like, you know what, if I don't do all this sort of stuff, I start to fall apart and I can't perform. Or you might be just a pure performance-based athlete, athlete right off the bat. But ultimately you lead to what I call the bottom of the period. If you have aesthetics here and performance here, ultimately the answer comes down to health. And health is the foundation of all of our components. And it was ironic that it was the loss of my sister's health that got me attracted to this. I thought, well, if I look this way, I will be healthy. And that was a very uh, juvenile look at, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the whole equation. It's taken me literally 30 years to kind of get the whole picture. And that's why we're such an advocate for our education and promotion of that, which we give away freely because – you don't know what you don't know and what you don't know can really hurt you uh, if you don't account for it uh, over the long run. So true. You really don't know what you don't know. I am hesitant sometimes to invite guests on who have their own product line. And that's for obvious reasons, but um, it's just I want to make sure that my listeners trust that the brands or the people that I'm bringing on are for more reasons than just to promote their products. But when I learned about bio-optimizers and I learned about you and your business partner and I, I learned about all the things you've achieved and what you really believe in, the line of products that you choose also to produce and manufacture or just say so much about the integrity of your brand. And it's so important to me because, I mean, we are about to dive into this. I want to pick your brain, but digestive enzymes and HCL, hydrochloric acid as a supplement, have totally transformed my relationship with mealtime and my digestive health and energy levels in a big way. I mean, I teach fasting uh, often to people with ADHD because that's why I fell in love with fasting. It helps me have better concentration at work and focus throughout the day. But even when I would break my fast and have that first meal, it would drag me down so much, no matter if it was a keto meal, no matter if it was, you know, zone and all that. It was just too much for my digestive system. And the combination of HCL with 
digestive enzymes sometimes, I don't take them at every single meal, um, just made it so much easier for my body to process all that food. And I have all the energy that I need to really just get through it and enjoy mealtime without too much thinking. So um, hats off to you guys for coming up with some really innovative products. I just switched over to your brand and I'm really excited to share that with some of my listeners. Why don't you tell us why you got so into digestion particularly? It, you know, this is a beautiful question because, again, first off, you scratch an itch of the head. I obviously compromise my digestion seriously going for a performance diet. But as I got into the uh, conversation deeper, what was the underlying conditions of what was causing the digestive distress in myself, I recognize that virtually everybody was going to end up with digestive dysfunction at some degree and it's going to continue to progress and I, there's a couple of reasons why and i want to caveat that and thank you for your accolades but one of the things that we do at bioptimizers first and foremost is we give away massive amounts of educational information not just about our products and services about the practices that i learned and you cannot supplement your way out of a bad diet period uh you can't supplement your way out of a poor lifestyle okay so those things need to be addressed first. And in order to do that, to get that right, you need coaching to get yourself straightened out. And that's, that's non-negotiable in my opinion. And I, I want to be clear about that. But I would say this. We had the, I would say, the road to uh, hell <laughs> is paved with unintended consequences. And if you look at the grandscape of human history, we starvation and disease related to nutritional deficiency has been the biggest killers of humans there's been uh, i would also add to that uh you know parasites and bacteria and agents like that through bad water bad food those sort of things so i'll categorize water in that equation still a big issue today amongst a, a large portion of the world so over the last hundred years and certainly it's been accelerated very aggressively since World War II. We've developed incredible levels of modern food production and distribution. To give you an idea, at the turn of the century in the 1900s, 98% of the people uh, worked on a farm. So food production was the number one priority of staying alive on the planet. Today, it's less than 2% of people work in the food production industry. So we developed modern methodologies in uh, the production and distribution of food that allowed us to solve the calorie issue. So did you have enough protein? Did you have enough carbohydrates? Do you have enough fats? All that sort of stuff. Well, we, we solved that. Unfortunately, in our quest for that, we had some unintended consequences. And number one, I believe the definition of food was an issue. And that is that we didn't include enzymes in food and we didn't include probiotics in food. And those are the two, only two things inside the body that does any kind of metabolic work. Enzymes are responsible from everything to thinking to blinking. And probiotics, uh, that relation of our microbiome, is essential for us to finish the digestive phase. And we'll talk about the five stages of digestion in a minute so that people can understand the form and function. I want to give you the big picture and then we'll kind of dive down. So... In this quest for modern food production, we started now instead of getting food locally and fresh, we started producing it and sending it off. We started growing it en masse. We stopped cycling between different um, crops. crops. We went monoculturing. We started adding nitrogen uh, to the soil, which depleted the protein content of the food, the enzyme content of the food, the mineral and vitamin content of the food, so much so that uh, you would have to eat like – 55 peaches today to get the equivalent nutritional equivalent of one peach in 1955. Whoa. Then as the plants got essentially weaker because they weren't subject to the normal conditions that they were uh, environment, you, 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 any kind of stress increases the hardiness of a plant. When these monoculture comes, we didn't have that. We started to use, then had to use genetic modification. We had then had to add herbicides and pesticides and fungicides as opposed to the, the plants creating their natural, uh, you know, defense mechanisms for that. Well, it turns out that herbicides, pesticides and fungicides disrupt enzymatic activity inside the body. And there was a guy by the name of Dr. Edward Howe 
who wrote books called en uh, Food Enzymes uh, for Health and Longevity and Enzyme Nutrition. And what he did is some experiments in the 40s and 50s. I was going to say, those are uh, old books, aren't they? Yeah. Like, but old was, research. Yeah, okay. they're, they're very old. And he was doing experiments with all different types of species because you could get multi-generation, you could run generations much faster. And he fed these animals enzyme deficient diets. And here's what happened. By the third generation, you had a uh, strange sociological behavior elicited by the species, the inability to procreate, and the uh, rapid advancement of genetic-based diseases. Let so me guess. Let's, That's what we're seeing now in humans. In fact, he predicted this uh, in the early 50s and 60s. He said this would be the natural result of what happens in humans because of what we've done to our food supply chain. Much of his research was buried in the Harvard uh, Medical Library until a guy by the name of uh, Victorious Kolvinskas actually found it stumbling around and went, oh my goodness, here's the answer to what is a, a, an escalating problem that no one's identifying. I mean, if you look at just, for example, autism, uh, we had like, what, one in 40,000 people 40 years ago, and now it's like one in 110. Oh now, God. I mean, like, you do not get that kind of mutation based on genetics. That means there are external factors that are influencing that. And I would suggest that the disruption in our food production, supply and distribution chain has accelerated that as well as the chemical agents, uh, both in the food supply and also what we've produced as a species. And as people who are looking for health and vitality and to have the best that we want to do, we have to recognize these agents are compromising our digestion and we need to counteract that with some sort of strategy that's effective. Yeah, there's a lot to to take in there for our listeners. I just want them to kind of summarize this for a moment by just saying, although most of us are very passionate about getting our nutrients from real food and we might do everything that we can to have healthy food on the table for our families, fresh ingredients, maybe sourced from a local farm. There are still so many things out of our control that have changed just based on our history as a civilized nation and as a society. And if the nutrients aren't there in the soil, they're not in your vegetables. If the farmers can't produce enough to make a living, they're going to turn to things like genetically modified seeds or herbicides and fungicides because their livelihood depends on it. And although we have the best intentions to get everything from food, I often tell my family and, and clients, I don't know if that is entirely possible for us today. I think we do need to turn to supplements uh, in, in a lot of cases. And I think enzymes are one of the least talked about ones uh, right now, it's the least familiar category. Everybody's finally hip to the probiotics idea, but they don't understand the complexity of probiotics and how much we still have to learn about that. I'm sure you have plenty to share there, but I do think that enzymes need to be part of the conversation now. And um, well, teach us well, a little bit about that. Well, let's just look at the facts. Um, in the United States today, uh, on any given day, there's a hundred million people, nearly a third of the population, who are suffering from some digestive distress. A quarter of the population is actually using uh, over-the-counter or prescription medication for digestive issues uh, on any given day. In our emergency hospital visits, 12% of those cases are gastrointestinal related. So that means you're going to a hospital in an ambulance because of some serious medical condition, most of which can be prevented by these methodologies. And so we have to understand digestion. So I'm gonna explain for your listeners in layman's terms, how digestion works inside our bodies and where they get compromised and so that they can understand this process. Cause it might be an aha Perfect. moment. And that's my, that's my goal is to kind of teach people a little bit about their body, what's happening and then how you can take care of it. So digestion happens in what I've narrowed down to five distinct stages. This is the first stage, which is the fun stage, the taste, touch, smell, food. So for example, if I say dill pickles and sauerkraut, a lot of people will start to salivate in their, their mind because there, there is literally the suggestion of those foods starts to create a response inside the body to prepare for the consumption of those foods. You could talk about Pavlovian dogs and all that sort of stuff, but we're not much different than the, the organism. So we bring the food into our body 
and we start to masticate it, which is a fancy name for chewing it. And the food, our body starts to register what this food is and how we're going to prepare for it. Now, humans are the only species in the world that eats their food cooked. And when we cook our food, we do not have any enzymes present in it. So if, I, if I'm a tiger and I eat a cow I, I, or a zebra in the, in, in the environment, I take out the zebra, I eat the entrails where the enzymes and probiotics are most prominent, and then I eat the carcass. If I'm a bear and I get a salmon or a blueberry, I eat it in a raw state. If I'm a, a cow or a horse, I eat the grass or the hay or whatever in a raw state, and I get the enzymes and probiotics present within that food, and therefore my body doesn't have to produce them. And the second stage of digestion, the food travels down the esophagus and goes to the upper cardiac portion of the stomach. And this is where the enzymes present in the food is supposed to start breaking down that food. If they're not present, then you have incomplete digestion to start, not to mention if you're watching TV and gulping down your food and not chewing it properly. So these are where issues start to begin. The second or the, the next phase of digestion, which is the third phase, is hydrochloric acid will then start to come into the body 30 to 60 minutes after you digest your food. So there's not this big pool of acid sitting in your stomach that a lot of people envision. It's actually a product of, number one, you need to be fully hydrated, and a lot of people are chronically dehydrated. And as we age, we produce anywhere from 60 to 70% less hydrochloric acid than we did when we were in our 20s, so someone in their 40s or 50s, for example. So what happens then is hydrochloric acid just, uh, serves two distinct features or functions in the body. The first one is it disinfects our food from viruses, from bacteria, from parasites and other pathogens that may disrupt our health or vitality or cause a problem. If we don't produce enough of that, we're much more susceptible, susceptible to uh, viral conditions or salmonella poisoning or whatever it happens to be food poisoning of all sorts. The second thing that hydrochloric acid does is it begins to change the pH of this food chine from maybe alkaline or slightly acidic to highly acidic. And as that food chine changes, some enzymes are going to be activated and some are going to be deactivated depending on what products are because they work in different pH brands and that completes the digestive process. It's very sophisticated. After that is completed, what will happen is your body releases what's called bicarbonate buffers. It's just a fancy name for alkaline minerals to buffer the acids. So it, when the food goes in the intestinal tract, you don't have any issues because your stomach is made for a high acidic condition. The rest of your body isn't. And stomach acid can be as low as one to two uh, on the pH level, which is super acid. Like it would burn right through your, your desk table or whatever. It's that potent. And if you have trouble um, with spillover, um, either from hydrochloric acid and not enough hydrochloric acid being produced will cause things like acid reflux and heartburn because you have mm -hmm. a little flap on the top that doesn't create enough. If you don't create enough, those are switched down and you start to ferment and gas will come up and some of that acid will splash up and burn your esophagus and give you heartburn and acid reflux. And the funny part is that they prescribe antacids for that when you're not producing enough. If also, if you have an overproduction of, of hydrochloric acid and not enough uh, minerals, you get in, you, it'll spill over and cause gastritis or duodenal ulcers or these type of things that people will suffer from ulcers. Oftentimes, stress will produce a lot of hydrochloric acid and stuff. So that's the, the downside of not having enough acid. I might have to interrupt you just to make yeah. sure everybody realizes what he just said, because you might want to hit rewind on that one, you guys. He's explaining the paradox or the misconception of acid reflux and that it can and often is related to low stomach acid. So although you might momentarily find relief from taking your antacids, you are only prolonging the issue and, you know, making it more likely to keep continue occurring. Is that correct? Indeed. Also, you are disrupting your body's natural ability to break down food and your natural ability to, to fight off, um, pathogenic organisms mm -hmm. that, that could, can now get lodged in any part of your body and create all sorts of havoc. So in that la that next stage, the fourth stage, what happens is that food chime comes out and enters into the intestinal tract. And there is anywhere from 200 to 500 uh, strains of various types of bacteria. 
I call them the good, the bad, and the other ugly. 10% good, 10% bad, 80% opportunists. And this microbiome is changing all the time based on your dietary choices. And that's why oftentimes when you switch diets, there is an adjustment period of anywhere from a week to three weeks as you get acclimatized to that new diet. And, 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 and so that's where you go through food cravings or stomach disruptions or skin breakouts or all these sort of things as the microbiome starts to change. Now, anybody that has been subjected to excessive washing of their hands through, uh, you know, through antibacterial practices, uh, the use of antibiotics uh, inside their body or extremely stressful situations often destroy much of their good bacteria. And the problem is, is there's actually anywhere from five to 10 times the amount of these bacteria cultures inside your body than you have cells in your body. And it's a symbiotic relationship without these bacteria, we will not be able to turn our food into either energy units or building blocks. It's so if enzymes are cutting the grass, you know, of our food, if you imagine, then probiotics would be like mulching it. It, it finishes off and makes the small particles that, that we use for energy, we use for building blocks and different bacteria. And, you know, 95% of your neurotransmitters are made in your guts. Okay. So people who are suffering from all sorts of Neurological conditions often is a correlation between disruptions in their bacteria cultures. I don't know why I feel good, you know, because you can't make the polypeptide chains to make, you know, your happy hormones and your happy neurotransmitters. And so um, this environment, which we're, as you illustrated, we're starting to enter into what I call the golden age of probiotics. It's starting to catch on. Nobody was talking about this in 2004 when I got started in this. Mm -hmm. um, now everybody's talking about it and we're learning more and more and we're getting testing and it's getting better and better. And I think when, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, we're going to have completely different conversations about where we're at. So, but we're in the conversation, which is good. And then the final stage of digestion after that's been all done is you remove the waste out of the body through what's called peristaltic contraction. And that is the, really the contraction of smooth muscles. So the muscles that you see on your body are striated muscles and the muddies inside your body is smooth muscles and both of them contract and that's what moves. Now today we have highly sedentary lifestyles. We sit a lot. Um, how we go to the bathroom, you know, doesn't actually activate a lot of this peristaltic contraction. And oftentimes people have a physiological issue. Like constipation. Exactly. That causes constipation. Also, I would also say that um, when people get diarrhea or the runs, it's often actually also because of constipation or buildup that is called a narrowing of this canal. And so constipation and uh, diarrhea are actually oftentimes different aspects or different sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. And so these are the areas where people run into problems. Number one, they don't have enzymes in the food. Number two, they have low or insufficient levels of hydrochloric acid. And number three, they have an imbalance in their microbiome because of the good and bad bacteria. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yes. Okay. So you're saying, I would imagine um, that when everybody's all excited about probiotics, that's great, but they haven't handled the two really important things that prepare the food for the probiotics to be able to do their work or to populate your gut in a way that will give you the results you're looking for. Maybe that's why people are like, I'm taking probiotics and I don't feel any better. I'm not, you know, still can't go to the bathroom regularly, yada, yada, but because they didn't take care of the initial steps. Is that what you would agree with? Okay. Uh, absolutely. So number one, um, you know, I have a philosophy which you give away on the site. We'll give it away to you guys too. Is I call it the awesome health philosophy. And it starts with air, water, exercise, the three non-negotiables. And then we go into sunlight, optimizers, mental beliefs, attitude, education, testing, and coaching. These are the pillars of what creates a healthy program. And the, the foundational component is creating a lifestyle, eliminating all the things that are screwing you up, number one, first and foremost. And, yeah. and, getting, and, and, and eating real food not compromise food. But what happens is a lot of people who have digestive distress, they find that there's only certain types of food that they can now eat because their system is so compromised. Even if you put them on a good diet, yep. that, that causes more pain. And it's these people, which I'm really reaching out to and talking about this because they're suffering and they're heading, they're heading to be a statistic in those emergency hospital visits. And my goal is to educate them as that there are alternative, holistic, proven 
methodologies that allow you to reverse the trend that you might have been on for the last 30, 40, 50 years. And you can change that around in, in, in as little as 90 days to really rebuild and reset your complete digestive system. And and it, the, the quality of life that you get is uh, certainly worth it. It really is. It makes a huge difference. I mean, there was a long time that I, I started with digestive enzymes when I first discovered that I was gluten intolerant and I had to do a low FODMAP diet. And I've been through like so many things trying to heal my leaky gut, you know, seven plus years ago. And ever since then, I've been like, wow, digestive enzymes like work awesome. But I didn't know a whole lot about them. And everyone kept saying, you got to take it before a meal or they don't work. And I was like, I swear I take them during a meal, after a meal, and they work no matter when I take them. And so I don't know what they're doing, but they're doing something and I love it. So I literally have carried around them digestive enzymes in my purse for the last six years. Yeah, and, one, of uh, these, uh, one of these little containers that I put right in my little change pocket of my jeans. It's best. I mean, I know I can eat then a gluten-free pizza crust at a restaurant that's probably made with a bunch of grains that I'm not used to eating or digesting. And uh, I'm not going to have uh, gas bloating things that would be my usual symptoms. And I also know it's better for my body. I mean, my body needs that support. You're making it very clear that usually these enzymes would be present in the food or perhaps, you know, just epigenetically, we would still be producing them in our in our bodies. But many of us are not. And why should we go without them if that's one of the most fundamental things of digestion? So walk us through kind of a, a brief overview of who should take enzymes, when they should take them, just the basics. Sure. I'll, I'll go back to um, Dr. Edward Howell's uh, food enzymes for health and longevity. And one of the things that he noted is that Every single species that were deficient in enzymes versus supplemented with enzymes had a, a very big difference in not only their lifespan, but their health span. And so he believed that everybody had what he called an enzyme bank account, a limited reserve of the amount of enzymes. And keep in mind, there's over 25,000 different functions that enzymes do inside the body. So these are the workers that write those metabolic checks, I say, from everything from thinking to blinking. And one of the reasons that, and to give you an illustration that people can relate to, is we've all had what I call turkey dinner syndrome. And that is you go for a Thanksgiving dinner or a Christmas dinner and you have the big dinner with all the right stuff. I mean, there's a lot of good food there. There's like potatoes and there's vegetables and there's, you know, plus the turkey and you think, hey, this is really good meal. And then, you know, they have another helping and grandma brings out the cherry pie or whatever. And like you go in and then what happens literally after dinner? Everybody's making a dash for the living room. Someone's passed out on the couch. Someone's in the rocking chair, falling asleep, you know, snoring. Another one's on the floor, drooling out of their face, passed out. Well, well, you would think if, if just eating all that food was all that was required, you should be able to go out and run a marathon. But it's your ability <laughs> to digest and convert, uh, absorb and utilize that food that determines that. And basically what you've proven is that you do not have the digestive capacity. So your brain shuts down enzymes from its muscles, from its mental functions, it's healing processes in order to go to the stomach and, and digest this food. Mm. And we already noticed that many of us find that we can't eat a lot of the foods that we used to when we were young as we get older. And I would put forth that this is because our enzymatic potential or capacity or bank account, whatever you want to call it, begins to diminish and we just can't write as many checks mm -hmm. in that area. And so that's why our we get goal. gray hairs, you guys. That's that's why our hairs turn gray. We stop making certain enzymes that, you know, it, it cause us to have these, like, I guess, bleaching hydrogen peroxide effects inside our cells. And enzymes just do everything. It's incredible. And as we age, we're going to lose them naturally. So Exactly. Ahead. And it kind of goes on a, on, a, on a decreasing scale of priority. And it's, it's a fascinating stuff. And, of course, my background was in the athletic world. And you see very few people who are able to, like, for example, let's take NFL football players, like running backs, who are subjected to a lot of impact. And the recovery requirements of a running back is superior to everybody else's in the sport. And that's why they have very short careers because they take so much damage. And there's only, I think, three running backs in the history of the NFL that have been able to maintain their production after the age of 28 years old. Mm. And that and, and that correlates directly with a massive shutdown of proteolytic capacity that typically happens in humans around that age. Very, very fascinating. And I go, if you extrapolate that over to the population and you get someone that's, you know, 40 years old, 50 years old, et cetera, you can bet that other areas are going to be compromised. Same thing if you're exposed to chemicals. 
if you're exposed to radiation, if you're exposed to all these agents, it's going to be your enzyme production that heals your body. And it's also why I think fasting has become so popular. The mechanism of fasting, how it works is that it frees up your enzymatic potential that you're not spending all this energy to digest food to go heal the other components of the body. Mm -hmm. So I've been into fasting for 20 plus years now. Wow. And, and, and it was one of the reasons that turned me on to using enzymes. I'd take mass amounts of enzymes in acceleration to fasting to accelerate the effects of autophagy wow. and recovery and healing and stuff because I understood the mechanism. That's so cool. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, the bottom line is I'm not surprised that fasting has become so big now because I think it is a natural response to understanding the, the, the digestive stress that we are under as a species, as a population in the world today. And that we it, it's one way of dealing with the current issues, but you can't starve your way to health. These are short-term components that can enhance our health and are certainly a valuable tool in the toolbox, but are not necessarily applicable in day-to-day -day life all the time. No, uh, and it's not you know, easy information to get your hands on. It's not easy to understand or to decipher between what's the truth and what's not, especially when you ask your doctor if you should take digestive enzymes and they might say, oh, that won't do nothing or you know, that's not for what you have or, you know, honestly, like it's, this is a booming field and it's very um, holistic in nature and it's not going to be widely accepted at first. It's gonna take a long time, just like probiotics did. And I think, um, Anyone who's listening, I understand if you don't have time to listen to this full episode, but I'm going to take Wade into a couple more really important topics that I'm sure you'd like to listen about HDL and enzymes. But you can go to biooptimizers.com and use the code Foundation Wellness 10. So that's all one word, Foundation Wellness 10, to get 10% off and um, check out all the enzymes he has. So when somebody is looking for digestive enzymes, first of all, how do they know like which kind to buy? There's so many different types of enzymes in a lot of these products, including your own. And does it matter when they take them? Yeah, great question. So first and foremost, if you run out to your local store or your Whole Foods or whatever nutrition store, you're going to see enzyme products on the counter that are 10 bucks a bottle and enzyme products that like are $130 a bottle. And you're like, well, it looks like it's got protease, amylase, and lipase. So protease, amylase, and lipase are what I call the big three. Protease probably being the most important digestive enzyme, the most expensive digestive enzyme, and the one that'll be the least amount in most brands. Secondary is amylase, and third is lipase. And then there's kind of derivatives of that, you know, from cellulase, which breaks down plant. And each one of those, so protease breaks down protein, amylase breaks down carbohydrates, lipase breaks down fats, cellulase breaks down plant proteins. Now, in selecting that, there's different types of enzymes. There's plant-based enzymes, there's animal-based enzymes, there's systemic enzymes, and there's cultured enzymes. So animal-based enzymes work in a very narrow pH bands, and they're often for specific types of conditions, but not as universally applicable. Plant-based enzymes um, will be enzymes that just come from plants. They've just grown, you know, they took it like bromelain or papain or food enzymes that are sometimes referred to. And then there are systemic enzymes, which are enzymes that you'd only take on an empty stomach, something like natokinase, for example, or serapeptase, which is used for scar tissue. And then there's what's called cultured enzymes. And a cultured enzyme is an enzyme that is fermented and grown on specific mediums over long periods of time that will give you an enzyme that's 100 to 1,000 times more potent than something you would find in a plant or in an animal and with a much wider pH uh, range applicab applicability. And so that's... Number one. Second thing you really want to focus on the proteolytic component because undigested proteins are the most common element inside the body that cause inflammatory response, histamine response, allergic reactions, uh, inability probably to break down gluten, all, that all these type of things. That, like demonizes protein is probably a lot to do with that too because there's just so much information out there making people afraid of consuming protein. And um, I think that that's probably a huge reason because we can't even break it down and metabolize it. Well, that's it. Any food that you do not eat now becomes a potential toxin. And if you do, if we go through that digestive process and you've got undigested protein, well, guess what? That now can feed the bad bacteria, which produce indole and skatol that literally poop in your blood. You start getting things like leaky gut and you feel bloated all the time. You have digestive, you have high gas. 
maybe skin conditions, you're waking up with the crust in your eyes in the morning or bad breath all the time. These are good indications that you've got undigested protein sitting in your system. So hmm. again, if you going historically, I mean, the United States Congress knew that wheat was 90% protein at the turn of the century. This is how people lived on bread in Europe 300 years ago. Today, bread is now less than 7% and is oftentimes highly contaminated with things like glyphosates, which interrupt, guess what? Your enzymatic activity, same as these herbicides and pesticides and fungicides, they interrupt your enzymatic activity. So people will eat gluten in North America, can't eat it. Then they go to Europe, they visit their relatives in Italy, they stay at a bed and breakfast, they have all this pasta, they have this stuff that's grown right there in the garden, comes out, doesn't have the gluten. Stuff. And they're like, I felt amazing in Italy. I didn't yeah. have any problems. Well, that's because you didn't have these agents that were disrupting your digestive process and you could actually break it down. So those are the kind of the situational aspects that are happening. And I believe you're 100 percent right, is that we're not getting enough protein in our diet that is absorbable and utilizable by the system. And that becomes a potential toxin. Mm -hmm. And of course, they're saying reduce the protein, reduce the protein. But and uh, you would uh, agree that's plant proteins and animal proteins, like in both cases, both in cases. both food groups, people are having trouble accessing, metabolizing, breaking down these proteins. And, and people are giving up entire food groups because of that. And they don't realize there's anything they could do about it. Yeah, well, well we're seeing uh, the emergence of what I call uh, dietary extremism because it, it, as a response to conditions. And I was well aware of that years ago. I, you know, I went on a completely raw food diet. I see now on the other end of the spectrum, we have people going into carnivore um, in order mm -hmm. to deal with things. And I'm not saying that those things are bad. I'm dietary agnostic. Choose a diet that works best for you. But I believe that you cannot restrict your way to ultimate health. Mm -hmm. At some point, you have to address the actual functionality of the digestive system so that you should have more choices as a healthy person instead of less choices. Yes. And that's our goal so that I can go out with my friends on Friday night totally. and have a glass of wine and some pizza and not worry that my weekend is going to be ruined. <laughs> yes. Right. I mean, that's yeah. I mean, that's kind of what we I mean, it's the goal of, of health and vitality is so that we can enjoy life, not restrict our lives. And that's our mission and our and our mandate as a company. I agree. Same. Yeah. Oh, awesome. And and so if we start taking these broad spectrum enzymes, um, leaning towards a higher quality brand or a brand that really has, uh, you know, a lot to say about sourcing or the quantities that they've chosen or has research to back it up. That would be a great way to help us pick out which enzymes. And then should we take them every day? Should we take them with every meal? Should we take them? I, I tell you from personal experience, it didn't matter really what time I took them. I always had a positive experience, but tell us a little bit about that. Uh, well, the variance of digestive, how fast a person uh, goes through the digestive transit time is going to be based on how their internal organs are set up. So there's ectomorphs, mesomorphs, and endomorphs who have uh, fast, medium, and long transit times. Hmm. So that's going to vary between the per person's background. Second thing is, is how, what, how compromised their system is and what types of food that they're eating is going to also determine. For example... If I'm eating a really clean diet that's like fresh, organic fruits and vegetables and, you know, that sort of stuff and, you know, maybe farm like grass fed beef and stuff like that, I'm, I'm probably going to require much less than someone who's eating nothing but, you know, processed, chemicalized, food dye laden, chemically charged foods with all sorts of garbage in it. Okay, that's going to be a very different dietary practice. So you always have to account for both sides of that okay. uh, of the equation, first and foremost. Second, of, um, I take enzymes before every single meal. Some people prefer to break the caps open and sprinkle it on your meal. Hmm. Uh, uh, that's another way to do it if you have trouble with caps. But the general rule of thumb is enzymes before, hydrochloric after. Uh, that that'll. Mm -hmm. help always gets you in the right spot uh, inside the system. And probiotics depends on the probiotics. Some are taken best on an empty stomach. Some are go with food. So depending on what probiotics are right for you would determine where that fits on the equation. Yeah, that's a whole episode in its own. And maybe we will have you back to talk about probiotics because I know that there's a, a huge need for that. And um, it's, so, it's confusing for everybody. But uh, enzyme-wise, let's wrap this part up and then get into HCL real quick. Enzymes 
there's a lot that are for particular things. Like I can buy glutenese or I can buy light bees, which is like specifically to help me with certain things. And I was drawn to that. I was like, oh, this can help me digest gluten and casein, the protein in dairy. I was like, I really need that. So that's the one that I started with. But um, would you say that the broad spectrum ones are really helping you hit that anyway? So you don't need specified ones? Yeah, when we develop masszymes, it's enzymes for the masses. We, we contain 17 different types of enzymes. My business partner is a ketogenic guy, and I'm a plant-based guy. So we're far apart on the dietary spectrum, and we had to have something that addresses both ends and as well as everything in between. And so that's why we developed that product, Runner Third Generation. We also have what's called enzyme enhancers. So there's a product called Astrozyme, which is an uh, astrologous extract. Uh, which is a foundational component of Chinese medicine, and it's been shown to improve the efficacy of the enzymes you take by 30 to hmm. 66 percent. And this is a very critical factor uh, in the formation of that. And of course, our enzymes are all cultured. So depending on and 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 depending on what level of digestive distress, we always suggest they would take anywhere from one to five capsules, depending on the size of the meal, how compromised their digestive system is. Uh, that that they're that they're eating, and so usually we set there's a kind of a standard system that we allocate. Start here, get the effective dose, and then titrate down so that you get the minimum effective dose. And then ultimately, as people go along and their digestive systems kind of reboot, uh, it stops the inflammatory conditions and stuff. You typically need less and less mm -hmm. as you go forward. And the capsules are really small, you guys. These um, the masszymes is that what you call it? Yes. Those those ones are, are small. So he said like three to five, but it's not a lot. I wanted to ask you, do you, does your team do consultations or anything for people who are overwhelmed by all the options, don't know where to start? So first and foremost, we give very specific educational components. I actually have a series and when people go to that site that you referred to, um, they can actually access our digestive health vault. And so I've interviewed uh, an expert in digestive health that do it with gas, with bloating, with heartburn, uh, constipation. And we go in depth, just like you were having a naturopathic doctor consultation that would cost you anywhere from 150 to 500 bucks. We actually go through that and you can actually listen to this and all the things that you can do in before you even start with any digestive product. That's one we're education component based first, uh, first and foremost, because you gotta get the foundational aspects and understand why you would need it. Uh, as an educational component. So that's that That would be the first step that a person takes in their journey is get educated about your condition. As far as independent uh, enzymes, yes, we do do that. We also have some standardized programs that we have found to be work. I mean, we've done, I think, well, we've helped now it's almost close to 100,000 clients deal with these conditions. So we found things that are very work. For people who are really compromised, I would suggest Set aside 90 days and do a complete 90-day gut reset. Reboot the entire system, go on elimination diet, take massive dosages of this for, for 90 days, reset the system, and then titrate down from that. If you have a little bit of digestive issues, again, that you could take a specific product, try it. And with us, we always have our, our first bottle, free bottle guarantee. If it doesn't work for you, if you don't feel the difference, you immediately tell us and we give you your money back and we'll actually send you a product. Let's say you think you needed hydrochloric acid, but you really needed enzymes. You took hydrochloric acid, that didn't work for you. And you say, hey, it didn't work for me. We'll send you, and you talk to us, we'll send you a bottle of enzymes and all questions directed to us, we answer directly. So uh, I answer personally. So we've got a database of uh, getting close to, I think, 8,500 to 9,000 answers to questions they have. And if we can't answer your question, it's a medical issue we refer out to uh, a person that may be able to treat with this. And then if they want to customize the VIP experience, we do have a research team that will provide that for you as well. Wow, that's awesome because I think I would take you up on that. Um, it's definitely needed. And let's talk about before we wrap up, because I can't believe it, we're almost at an hour already. The hydrochloric acid idea of supplementing with that is just like, scares people. It scared me at first. I have to admit, it scared my physician's husband. I mean, my physician husband, he was just like, I don't think you should be taking that. And I, you know, have some trusted sources that I really look to and like Chris Cresser, I'm sure you know. And I over and over kept learning about hydrochloric acid. And I was like, I, I have a lot of symptoms that 
suggest that I may be low in, in stomach acid and I just take a small dose. I don't even take a lot. Like I've heard that you can just keep taking them until you get a slight burning sensation or sensation and then just back off a little. That's how you find your perfect dose. I never even did that. I took, I take one or two capsules with almost every meal, especially if it has a lot of meat in it. And I am amazed at how much more energy I have and how much quick, more quickly I digest my food. So, um, do you think that a, a lot of people should try that? And without giving medical advice, I mean, who is it really for? Simple, easy tests. Because uh, the average person by 30 to 40 years old is is not producing enough hydrochloric acid, period. That's across the board uh, for many of the reasons that we illustrated and a whole lot more. We don't have time to go into it at this moment. But all you need to do is take a quarter teaspoon of baking soda, stir it up in a glass of water, uh, four to six ounces of water, drink it down. If you don't burp within five minutes, you're not producing enough hydrochloric acid. Oh, my God. This is the coolest thing ever. Okay, I don't, I never heard that. So you said stir a quarter teaspoon of baking soda in a small glass of water, around five ounces of water, drink it, and if you don't burp within five minutes, that means you don't have enough hydrochloric acid in your stomach. You got it, and that's how you know uh, whether you have that. And then for those who want to see uh, the enzymes and hydrochloric acid work together in digest food, we actually threw a piece of steak in a cup. And we added the enzymes and then we added the enzymes with the hydrochloric acid and it'll actually show you in on the camera, it actually break down in the video that's on that web page that you referred to. It's very fascinating and you can actually see the product working. Or it's, it's really fun and we try to give illustrative components inside your system. It would work even better, but we are actually to demonstrate it in a cup. I'm curious. That is cool. That is really cool, by the way. I am curious. Do you think people should drink? water with their meals, like even if they're not thirsty? Yeah, there's there's a lot of evidence to suggest that uh, most people are chronically dehydrated. Uh, so I used to do testing with a, what's called an electro-interstitial water scan, which, mm. is, which is basically will regulate the hydration levels of organs. And people were, that came into my clinic, like everybody was not, was chronically dehydrated. And the, the, the side effect of chronic dehydration is that you don't produce enough hydrochloric acid. You need water to produce this inside the body. And so I believe that it's not that water is going to dilute your hydrochloric acid levels. What water will do is it'll delight, it dilute your enzymatic capacity. Mm. And so um, because you're only producing enough enzymes and the water will dilute the amount of enzymes present per the chime, uh, hydrochloric acid is so strong that even if you drank a, a lot of water, uh, it would still go very, very acidic, sufficient Good enough you know. if you're producing enough hydrochloric acid. But general rule is uh, 15 to 30 minutes before meals is best. And that will actually help you produce more hydrochloric acid by staying properly hydrated. And that is chlorine fee free fluoride free and, and chloramine free water. So make sure you have really highly filtered water in order to do that prior to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much. There's just so much information here. And I know you have also um, products to help people repopulate the bacteria that enhance your mood, uh, cognibiotics. Uh, you also have an enzyme blend that's for keto dieters, especially people who have a high fat diet and you, um, might want to leave us with one more tip. What is the single biggest thing that a person can do to improve their digestion? I would say uh, stop eating in front of the television. Number two would be stop eating um, food that doesn't grow or make a sound. <laughs> 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 you know? Yeah. And, and then the third thing is... Um, you know, in, in, invest in optimizing your digestive system, because I think that virtually everybody uh, in the population has some degree of compromisation and that's going to accelerate over time. And you want to reverse that trend early so that you don't end up with the gastrointestinal. So I kind of squeezed in three things, but I think uh, one thing uh, isn't sufficient enough. Yeah. I don't think anybody thought you were going to say the number one thing is to stop eating in front of the TV. So um, I, I'm excited to bring this to my audience. I, I'm sure they're just going to eat it up. And if they want to find you, Wade Lightheart, not BioOptimizers, where do they follow you? 
Well, uh, you know, the best way is to follow me on Bioptimize. I, uh, my social media is relatively limited and okay. all our communication goes through that. They can find me at Wade Lightheart or whatever, but I talk about a variety of subjects that are not necessarily related to <laughs> the health and wellness. Okay. But they're more than welcome to jump by. Uh, Bioptimize is always relative to the topic that we're discussing today. Okay, cool. Thanks so much for your time. It's just incredible to pick your brain and maybe we'll have you back for a probiotic conversation sometime. That would be delightful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye. Cool. Well, thanks for sticking it through to the end. And just a reminder, you can grab 10% off BioOptimizers by going to BioOptimizers.com slash Foundation Wellness. There's no oven there, just Foundation Wellness. And you could also just use a 10% off discount code when you're checking out, which is Foundation Wellness 10. And I am going to do a giveaway. I'm going to give away tons of cool digestive enzymes and HCL and all sorts of probiotics to a couple of lucky winners. And everything is from BioOptimizers. So be sure to be following us on Instagram. And my page is Marisa underscore moon underscore. And the podcast page is Foundation of Wellness underscore podcast. And if for whatever reason you are not on Instagram, be sure you're inside our Facebook group. That's the Foundation of Wellness. And the links are in the show notes. Talk to you later.